Hello, church. It's great to be back with you again as we continue our study on equipping the church to evangelize in this ever-changing 21st century. So glad you tuned back in with us, and I pray that these studies are very helpful to you and the people that you're trying to lead to Christ for God's glory. All right, well, we are in the middle of a pandemic, as we know, and I keep reminding us this in every study, but again, we have to find new ways to evangelize. The message never changes, but the way and the means that we take that message to the world can change and does change and so you got them phones use them make calls have those bible studies over the phone send things through the mail and use them computers and i'm so glad that uh you're using these videos and you can always get on my website uh, on the youtube channel on uh, saving souls in the 21st century and i've got two channels there one of the older videos some of the newer videos that are uh, being posted every day here and I pray that you can use these, send these links to people, and uh, maybe they'll help them. Uh, so that's what we've got to do. We can't quit. We've got to keep going. All right. Hope you got your Bible with you today. And whenever we go out and study with people, we want to make sure we always have our Bibles with us. Uh, you might want to need, might want a pen uh, to take some notes and. Uh, Hope you've got that workbook with you, Saving Souls in the 21st Century, which these studies are developed off of. And remember, this is not a substitute for the Bible. Uh, it's only to help lead people to the Bible. And if you need a copy of this, uh, I can tell you how to get one at the end of this lesson. All right. Well, in that uh, workbook, there's also a prayer list that we can pray for people every day, for not for their health, not for all the other things that we normally pray for them for, but for their salvation. That's what this prayer list is specifically for. And this is going to help change us. So the next time that we see them, we're going to start thinking evangelistically. We're going to look for opportunities. And we're always going to be thinking about their souls. So prayer does change us. And it also involves God. And we want God right next to us as we go out and reach these people. Uh, so keep praying and keep meeting new people. All right, well, chapter one of this workbook was Reaching the Lost, and that is on page five, and that was to motivate you and I to get out and evangelize, and I hope that has helped us and uh, motivated us, and now we are at the point of, okay, now I'm motivated, I'm ready, uh, but now I'm ready to study with somebody, where do I take them? And that's a good question, and... So we have went through some stuff uh, in chapter two, uh, leading someone to Christ. That's what this chapter is about. There's six studies here, and we have went through two of them so far. The first one was a sin problem. We brought them down in a sense to show them that they have a problem, that sin separates us from God. It is a terrible place for anyone to want to be. And then in our next study, we brought them up in a sense and we gave them God's solution to the sin problem, the grace faith system. And we went through that last week. If grace is not in, or this last study, uh, grace is not in place, faith is not in place, then we cannot have salvation. It doesn't matter where you're at in the Bible. And we went through that study. And basically, when you get to the end of that study on page 31, you're going to see a chart that I've put together, basically putting the whole Bible on a piece of paper. Um, just showing this, that all these arrows on the bottom is everyone who has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's all of us. But some of the people in the Old Testament, some of the people in the New Testament, our time, uh, uh, had faith. And if their faith will connect to God's grace, which is Jesus coming and dying on the cross for us, satisfying God's wrath against our sins, then mankind can have heaven. Uh, for those people that do not have faith, that have sinned and fallen short of glory of God, of God uh, they cannot connect to God's grace, and thus they cannot have heaven. And the only other option is hell, eternal separation from God forever. And that is basically how the entire Bible works. Um, doesn't matter what what uh, Old Testament, New Testament, uh, it all works under that same basic principle. But 
Our faith is also, because there's obedience that comes from that faith, is uh, determined by covenant. Let me explain this. If you were living during the time of Noah, right? God made a covenant with him, told him to build an ark, get on. Uh, if he has faith, he will build the ark and put his feet on there, right? Um, but that's based on a covenant. Now, that covenant doesn't apply to me. I'm not building an ark, and neither are you in your backyard. So our faith is determined by covenant. That covenant, even though it's helpful for us to learn, does not apply to me. Uh, if we went a little bit farther in the Bible, we come to Abraham. Abraham was told to leave the land of Ur and go to the promised land. Well, if he's got faith, that's what he's going to do. He's going to pick up them feet and go to the promised land. That's your obedient faith. And that obedient faith is based on the covenant, the contract, the agreement that God made with Abraham. But here's the deal. God didn't make that agreement with me. I don't have to leave the land of Ur and go to the promised land. Right? And then if we went a little bit farther and we get to Moses, Moses goes up on uh, Mount Sinai, gets the Ten Commandments, all these ordinances, tells the people to keep the Day of Atonement, keep the Passover, uh, all these religious feasts, do animal sacrifices, keep the Sabbath, and on and on and on. That covenant was made to the Israelites. Now, if they have faith, what are they going to do? They're going to keep that covenant. But here's the deal. That covenant wasn't made to me. That doesn't apply to me. Okay, uh, so I don't keep animal sacrifices and I don't keep the Sabbath and I don't keep uh, uh, the day of Pentecost because that covenant wasn't to me. So we need to understand that our faith is determined by covenant. We are today are under the new covenant. And so we need to look at what the new covenant says. Look at those commands that God gave us. Keep those things. Do those things. And that's what our faith is determined on. Does that make sense? So a lot of our religious groups today, they mix covenants and they make an absolute mess out of uh, what they believe is Christianity. And so we need to know how to rightly divide the word of God and how the Bible works. So that is going to bring us to our next study, the covenant relationship. Now, I have never seen a workbook on evangelism in our brotherhood that really covers this. Uh, this is where I slow evangelism down. I want to give that, hopefully, that new Christian that's going to be a Christian soon. I want to give them a good foundation and understand the God that they are about to enter into. And he is a covenant God. And this covenant relationship is a binding agreement. And this is on page 31. So question is what is a covenant well I'm glad you asked here's the definition in the Greek uh, it's a disposition uh, specifically a contract a will uh, the King James uses the word covenant testament new covenant new testament they can be interchanged so it's a contract it's a will it's a it's an agreement okay that's what the word covenant means and it's found a lot in the Bible now there are different kinds of covenants in the Bible, and I want to just I want us to see some of the basic concepts of these covenants, so we'll have a, a good understanding of these. So here, let me give you some different kinds of covenants. Uh, this is what I would call a one-sided covenant. Okay, uh, I don't know if you know what this is a picture of. But I believe that this is a picture of Noah's Ark, or what remains of Noah's Ark. Uh, it's found about 12 miles from Mount Ararat. Um, it is the exact length uh, that uh, Noah's Ark is supposed to have been in the Bible. Uh, it's a little bit wider because it's kind of fallen out. It's basically a petrified piece of dirt. You can see over here on the side the rib timbers coming down. These are petrified pieces of wood. They have ran sonar across the top of this, and every so, feet, so many feet they find a piece of petrified, uh, like a spike with petrified wood around it. They are all over the top of this arc. Uh, they drilled into the side of this, and there was one cavity, that was one pocket that was not caved in. 
and they sucked everything they could out of it and they found ancient animal hair and a deer horn uh, that's interesting and there are 13 anchor stones that sit next to this uh, this is found on the oldest ships at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea and they were used for buoyancy but they are sitting out here in a field with a hole in the top um, the the valley the the oldest name for this valley is called the valley of eight well how many people got on the ark eight and um, the Babylonian account even though the Babylonians do not believe in God many other nations uh, have an account of Noah's ark they placed this ark right here in the spot nobody took them serious because they don't believe in God um, but uh, they do tell Noah's Ark in their, sto in their story. So the um, reason I've said all this is because God, when Noah got off the Ark, made a covenant with him. Okay, And he said, I will put my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. All right? And so every time we see that rainbow... God put that there to remind us that he is keeping his covenant. Now, my point is, is that this is a one-sided covenant. God made this covenant with the earth, with all of mankind, uh, with Noah and his family and all generations to come. But here's why it's a one-sided covenant. Because it doesn't matter what the earth does. It doesn't matter how man acts, if he's good or bad. God made this covenant. He gave this blessing. And and. God gives the blessing, man has to do nothing for it. It's one-sided. Only one side is obligated to do something in this covenant. Now let, us, let me show you a two-sided covenant. We find this in Malachi 2.14. And this, even though it's a two-sided covenant, this covenant is between equals. We find this in the marriage. We find this when people are... Uh, um, they enter into a covenant between uh, two nations and they, they're, they're equals and one nation makes a covenant with another and they ally themselves. You see this with David and Jonathan. They were best friends and they made a covenant with each other. Uh, the point of this covenant is though is that this is between equals. Okay, And so because of that we don't really enter into a covenant like this with God. And here's why. Because we're not equals. Uh, we don't tell God how it is, right? When two people get married, they say, okay, I'll do this, this, and this, the one says. And then the other one says, and I'll do this, this, and this. And the other one says, well, that sounds pretty good. And they enter into a covenant, okay? Well, we don't enter into a covenant like this with God. Even though God makes some connections between the marriage and our relationship, there is some differences with this one. This is the kind of covenant that God makes with us. And this is the one that has to do with our salvation. And this is what I want you to get your students to understand. That this kind of covenant is made by the superior, that is God. And it's made to the inferior, which is man. Now let me try to give you a good example of that. Does anybody remember what this picture is about? Well, this is the end of World War II. And here the Japanese are going to surrender to the United States and the Allies. Okay? Now, who is the superior here? Where is this picture taken at? This is on the battleship Missouri. Is not the superior showing their muscle? That if you do not keep the terms of this covenant, these guns will start to rain down bombs on your nation again so the superior is the allies united states and the inferior is the japanese that is the kind of covenant that deals with our salvation that's the covenant that we enter into with god he's superior and i'm i'm inferior i don't tell god how it is he tells me how it is and see, a lot of people in our world get that wrong. They think that, oh, I'll tell God how it is. I'll tell him, hey, this is what I like in worship, or this is what I think we should do, or this is how I think I should get married, um, and on and on, you know, or 
world marrying two guys and two girls. No, God did not set it up that way. We need to understand he is superior. So we're going to go over here to the book of Ezekiel. Let me lay out the, what's going on in the book of Ezekiel. The Babylonians had uh, come in three different times uh, into the nation of Israel. Israel has been worshiping other gods, and God has basically sent the Babylonians in to destroy them. And they came in and laid, laid three sieges on them. And the last one, they, they completely destroyed them. And that's the book of Ezekiel. And now they have been taken out of the land and they have went away into slavery, the Israelites. Watch this history lesson here because it's going to tell the story here. In Ezekiel 17, verse 11, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, Say to this rebellious house, did you not, Do you not know what these things mean? Say to them, The king of Babylon went to Jerusalem and carried off her king and her nobles bringing them back with him to Babylon. Then he took a member of the royal family and made a treaty with him, putting him under oath. He also carried away the leading men of the land. Remember Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Yes. So that the kingdom would be brought low, unable to rise again. Surviving by how? Only by keeping the treaty or the covenant. But the king rebelled against him by sending his envoys to Egypt to get horses and large army. Will he succeed? Will he who does such things escape? Will he break the treaty and yet escape? Now, what he's doing is he's giving a history lesson here. In this last series, he put King Zedekiah in place. And King Zedekiah said, you know what, after a while, I ain't paying your taxes. I'm going to go down there to Egypt, and they're going to come up here, and we're going to take care of you, Babylon. Okay? As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, he shall die in Babylon. Oh, really? This is what's going to happen to King Zedekiah? In the land of the king who put him on the throne, whose oath he despised, and whose treaty he broke. Pharaoh and his mighty, mighty army and great horde will be of no help in him, with him in war. When ramps are built and siege works erected to destroy many lives, he despised the oath by breaking, here it is, the covenant. Because he had given his hand and pledge and yet did all these things, he shall not escape. Now what's going to happen to King Zedekiah? Well, the Babylonians will come in for the third time, lay a siege around the town of Jerusalem, and the king, Zedekiah, will run out the back of the wall with his sons. The Babylonians will catch up with them. They will take all his sons and kill, kill them in front of his eyes. Then take his eyes and gouge them out, and then he will take him into slavery. Why? Because King Zedekiah did not keep covenant. This is what God is trying to tell us. This is what's going to happen to us if we don't keep covenant. God is a covenant God. This is serious stuff. And I think our students need to know who are they learning about? Who is the God that they serve? And it's, just, and it's serious. This will give them a better foundation as they come into Christianity. So, let's talk about God for a minute. We need to understand that God is also bound by covenant. Because remember, it's two parties entering into a covenant here, right? God is one of those parties. So we're going to go over here to Genesis 15. Really odd story. I don't know if you've read this lately or not, but this is going to cause you to have a lot of questions. Okay? All right. Let's see if we can make some sense of it. So we get over here, and here's Abraham. All right? His name is still Abram at this point. And God has been promising him a child, a child, a child. And Abraham just keeps getting older and older and older. All right? And so in verse 7, he says, and he also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur 
of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? See, covenant always contains promise. God has made a promise to him. Right? You're going to have a child, and through that child, they're just going to be this, like the sands of the seashore. Right? Uh, you're just going to, going to fill this earth, and you're going to have all these nations. And Abraham's like, but I ain't got a kid yet. <laughs> so how can I know that you're going, that I'm going to gain possession of it? This is the question. Watch God's answer. It's very interesting here. So the Lord God said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and young pigeon. Okay? So you got all these animals. Bring them. Okay? Then he brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The, the birds, however, he did not cut in half. Okay? So just think about this. This is, this is your answer. Abraham, you want to know if I'm going to keep keep my promise that I've made to you? Take these animals and cut them in two. What would that look like? Well, this is what it would look like. It'd be a bloody mess, right? There would be blood running down the center of this aisle between these animals. Okay? This is how you're going to answer me? This is how I'm going to know you're going to keep your promise, God? Yep, this is your answer. So look at verse 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. Okay? So you got some fire, smoking fire pot, blazing torch, passes between the pieces. Now watch, watch, watch what happens. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. He just entered into covenant with him, right? He wants to know, how am I going to know that you're going to keep your promises? And what does he say? I made a covenant with you. To your descendants, I will give you this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, uh, Kezanites, and Kedamites, uh, Hittites, Presbyzites, Raphamites, Raphanites, Amorites, Canaanites, Gigerzites, and Jebusites. Wow, a lot of Zites. Okay. There's your answer. Really? How? What's going on here? So here God is. He walks between these dead animals. And blood is running down the middle of this aisle. Now what does this mean? Huh. This is the beauty of the Bible. Even though it didn't explain it here, I love this verse in Psalm 160 or 119 verse 160. It says, the sum of thy word is truth. Church, we got to study and we've got to put these packages together. Watch over here in the book of, uh, we're going to look over here in the book of Jeremiah. What God is doing is God is making a covenant with Abraham and he must keep his promise. Have to. Why? Look over at Jeremiah 34. Now, Ezekiel was after the fact. The Babylonians came in, hauled them away into slavery, all right? After they had rebelled and rebelled and rebelled, okay? Jeremiah is before that. This is before they were actually taken away into slavery. And the Babylonians are coming in and actually laying a siege to Jerusalem. Watch what it says here in chapter 34, verse 17 through 20. It says, for, therefore, this is what the Lord says. You have not obeyed me. You have not proclaimed freedom for your fellow countrymen. So I now proclaim freedom for you. Declares the Lord, freedom to fall by the sword plague and famine i'll make you an abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth the men who have what violated my covenant they haven't fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me 
I will treat them like the calf they cut in two and walk between the pieces. See, that's how they made covenant in the Old Testament. They arranged the animals, blood ran down the middle, you walk between it, you make a covenant, they made a covenant with God, they have not kept their covenant. God says, I'll treat you like the animals you cut in two. Well, what do those animals look like? Killed, dead, blood, that's covenant. The leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the court officials, the priests, and all the people of the land who walk between the pieces of the calf, all hand over their enemies who seek their lives. Their dead bodies will become food for the birds of the air and beasts of the earth. See, covenant is a blood bond. And if you do not keep it, you will pay with your blood. If you walk between those pieces, you've got blood on you. The point is this, God is bound by covenant. If he does not keep his promises, he will be, in a sense, killed and cut in two. But we know God will not do that. He will always keep his promises. So he's telling Abraham, you can trust me. I'm bound by covenant. And what happened? Did Abraham have a kid? <laughs> he sure did. Did he become the father of many nations? Yeah, he sure did. God always keeps his promises, but he's bound. He's bound by covenant. And this helps us to understand how covenant works. Okay? Now, now let's talk about man. Let's talk about man because man is also bound by covenant. Okay? So we're going to go over here to Genesis 17. Now, at this point, this is really just a one-sided covenant. Only God has entered into this covenant. That was Genesis 15. Two chapters later, Abram or Abraham is going to enter into that covenant. Watch what happens. So we're going to see Abraham here. Okay. We're going to talk about circumcision. So look for Abraham. Look for circumcision. Look for the word blood. And look for the word covenant. Okay. And this is Genesis 17, 9 through 14. Let's see what it says. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So this is a sign of the covenant. Okay, watch the sign. For the generations to come, every male among you uh, who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household and bought with money from, from a foreigner. Those who are not your offspring, whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from my people. He has broken my covenant. So, see how serious this is? If you don't keep this covenant, you will be cut off. And notice that this involves blood, circumcision, right? Do you think that's just by chance? No. Absolutely not. So now this is a two-sided covenant, and Abraham has entered into that covenant. He must keep his end of the deal, and God must keep his end of the deal. All right? You got it? Well, let's go a little bit farther. Let's go a little bit farther down the timeline, and we're going to come to Moses. And I want you to look. Here we have the children of Israel. Look for the word blood, and look for the word covenant. And we find this in Exodus 24. So this is after Moses has went up, gotten the Ten Commandments and the ordinances. He brings them down to the people and reads them to the people. Watch what happens. Chapter 24, verse 6, it says, Moses took half the blood and put it in bowls. The other half he sprinkled on the altar. 
Then he took the book of the covenant, read it to the people, and they responded. We will do everything the Lord has said. We'll, we will obey. Okay? Okay? So they're saying, we're going to keep this. Then he took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of what? The covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now, could you imagine coming out of a church service like that and you got blood all over you? I mean, he's sprinkling it on them, right? And why? Why would God do that? Well, God wants you to go home and look and go, you know what? I told God I'd, I'd follow him. And if I don't, God wants me to remember, I'm going to pay with my blood. This is serious. This is the God that we read about in this Bible. He's not playing around, is he? No, he's not. He is not. I think this is important for our students to understand this before they become a Christian. Let's continue. So now let's go over here to uh, Moses and here's Aaron. Okay. All right. So we're going to look at Moses here. We're going to look at his son, uh, circumcision, blood, and covenant. And we're going to find this in Exodus 4, verses 24 through 26. Okay, so here's Moses. He's just talked to God through the burning bush. He has not went to Egypt yet uh, with the Israelites uh, to, to tell Pharaoh, let him go. And so he's on his way, and it says in verse 24, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. Uh, did we read that right? Did it say that God was going to kill Moses? Wait a minute, you can't kill Moses. We're going to need him. He's going to lead the Israelites out, right? He's going to write the first five books of our uh, Bible. You can't kill Moses. Why would he kill Moses? Well, let's look at verse 25. But Zimporah, now who's Zimporah? That is his Midian wife. She's not even an Israelite. So she took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, this is circumcision, and touched Moses' feet with it. It actually should say she threw it at him. She's mad. Why? Watch what she says. She says, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. You're fixing to go get yourself killed. Did I just say fixing? A Michigan guy down here in Texas. I am being influenced. You bet. Uh, yes. Fixing to get himself killed. Watch verse 26. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcised, circumcision. What was a child supposed to be that was an Israelite on the eighth day of life? They were to be circumcised. And if they weren't circumcised, God would cut them off from being his people. Right? Well, here we have this child. Don't know how old he is, but apparently he's supposed to be circumcised. Moses knows that being an Israelite. So here this Midian wife sees that Moses isn't doing what he's supposed to do. He's not circumcising his child. So the wife steps in and does it. And what was going to happen? God was going to kill him because he was not doing what he was supposed to do. He was not keeping covenant. So in verse 24, I'm going to kill you. Verse 26, I'll let, I'll let you alone. What happened in between? The child circumcised. God's pretty serious about this, isn't he? Oh, man, let me tell you. Did you know this was in the Bible? <laughs> This is serious business. Here's the point. Covenant keeping is a blood bond. And if you don't keep it, you'll pay with your blood. That's the God we serve. And those are the verses that we've been reading. Now, you may be tempted to say, well, that was all Old Testament, James. <laughs> we get to the New Testament, God is a God of love and he would never do those things to us today. That was Old Testament. Well, let's just see how serious God is in the New Testament. 
Let's go over here to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 26 through 31. Now, in the book of Hebrews, you're going to look for their purpose statements. And what you're seeing is, is there's plenty of purpose statements in the book of Hebrews. Those purpose statements tell us why the book of Hebrews was written. It was written specifically to Christians, right? And they were leaving the church. They were leaving God, right? Going back to their old ways. And he writes them this letter. Watch what he says in chapter 10, verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning, Christians, after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice of sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Now that's interesting, that word enemies. When we go to Romans chapter 5, it tells us that before we became a Christian, before we become a, a child of God, we were called enemies. Here, these are Christians now. And now that they're Christians, he calls them what? Enemies. Why? Because they have deliberately kept, they deliberately keep on sinning. So he gives an example here in verse 28 he says anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses right they got the rocks out and they would stone the people how much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the son of God underfoot could you imagine coming up to Jesus as a Christian and sticking your foot in the back of Jesus and then it says who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him there's that word covenant who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him that set him apart and who has insulted the spirit of grace for we know him who said it is mine to avenge i will repay and again the lord will judge his people it is a dreadful thing to fall in the hands of a living god of the living god why is this happening what is the deliberately sinning here well go back to the verse before this it talks about forsaking the assembly Right? Not to be in the habit of forsaking the assembly. These people are leaving Jesus. Guys, I want you to know very clearly that I left Jesus for 14 years. Well, I was 17 years old. The church split. Uh, from that, my parents got a divorce. And so I lost the church. I, I, I lost uh, my family. And I left and I went to my friends and got into partying and drinking and all the things that come for, from that for 14 straight years. Guess what I was doing? I was insulting the spirit of grace. I had trampled the Son of God underfoot. I had treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified me. I said, I don't need your blood, your holy blood to sanctify me anymore. I was deliberately sinning. I had forsaken the assembly. I, have, was, not, I was not keeping covenant. And if I would have died in that place, I would have been lost forever. But thanks to the Lord, he allowed me to come back. And guys, I don't want to go back to that. Our students need to understand this. This is the God we serve. And he demands that we keep his covenant. Amen. Mm, sorry to get a little emotional on you. So here's the conclusion. So here I am. I'm standing in front of God and it's the end it's judgment and i insist that god allow me into heaven here's the deal when we stand before god in judgment if we are not in covenant relationship with him then there will be nothing binding or obligating god to forgive us and allow us into heaven 
Do you understand that? He owes us nothing. Because we are not, first of all, we're not in covenant with him. We never entered into a covenant with him, right? So if there's no contract, there's no forgiveness. If there, if there's no, if there's no um, uh, contract, there's no guarantees. There is absolutely no hope. We must be in covenant with God, and we're going to talk about that in our next studies. It's going to show us how we enter into covenant with God under the new covenant. And then the key is to stay in covenant with God. And if we are, we will have all the promises that he has made to us. All we have to do is get in and stay in. So, no contract, no deal. And I think this slows evangelism down, but it's very serious and a very serious study that we need to have with our people and also with the church. We need to know this church, don't we? We don't hear a lot of sermons on stuff like this. We need to know about the serious, seriousness of God. So, if you'd like to get a copy of this workbook that has these studies in that, um, or one in Spanish, you got one in English, one in Spanish, uh, just, um, I'm gonna give you the contact information here in a minute. Uh, also, I've got the DVD videos, uh, 24 uh, video, uh, lessons on these uh, four DVD uh, uh, discs in this package. Uh, these are $25. The workbook in English is $15, and the Spanish book is $10. Uh, if you'd like to get a hold of me, you can go to SaginawPreacher at Yahoo.com. This is my email. Shoot me an email. Uh, also, uh, you can go to my website, SavingSoulsToday.com. And you can also call the Brown Street Church of Christ at 972-937-8855. Church, I hope you've been blessed today. I hope these are helpful to you. We got pretty serious today, but I think this is a really important study to have with these people that we're trying to lead to Christ. God bless you, and we will see you next time.